This series, as I mentioned, uh, comes to a conclusion today. Uh, first week was just an introduction. Um, hopefully, when we get the website back up and running, I'll reinstate the page that had the, the archived videos of those talks. Um, and at the end of the service today, for those of you who won't be able to download it, I'll have a copy of the booklet that I produced at the end uh, of my sabbatical. I've only brought 10 copies because it's quite a lot of printing. Uh, so if you're able to download at a later stage, then and don't take one of the printed ones. If you aren't able to, there'll be half a dozen copies at the front and half a dozen copies at the back that haven't been touched since Wednesday. So you're more than welcome to pick one up and take it away to read it. So that was introduction week. Uh, and then the following week I talked to Paul as a pastor that I, I just saw in him someone who really cared for those churches, uh, which is a difficult place for us to get sometimes when we just read parts of his letters and we read maybe the restricted behavior type sections and we don't see the pastor in those, but I just, I just saw him all the time as someone who cared and was hurt by his churches. And then week three about the... the the massive connection between Jesus and the Holy Spirit uh, to enable churches and individuals to have a faith and to operate. And last week on the topic of unity, about the, the crucial need for churches to be unified beyond the obvious requirement in the first century that actually if you disagreed with the church, you couldn't hop to another one anyway because there wasn't one nearby. Unity had a practical purpose, but it also has a theological and a moral purpose, in, particularly in the way that we connect with our surrounding communities, that if we're a unified church, we're an attractive church. Uh, disunity, though, brings about all sorts of issues. And Paul even said of that first century church, your worship does more harm than good, as he spoke to the Corinthians, because they were arguing with each other. They, they, were, they weren't unified at all. So this week, I come to the topic of uncomplicated. I just saw church through Paul's eyes in that first century era as an uncomplicated gathering of people. But it would be wrong of me. I was really pleased that Gloria was reading this morning, um, and you might have noticed the slight awkwardness of a passage in the middle that Gloria's reading. So there's a phrase you've got to recognize the elephant in the room. So we're going to recognize the elephant in the room. I'm going to do that very quickly because uh, I don't want us to be distracted by what we heard. If I take us just to the bit of text and the surrounding verses to it, if you were to go to uh, a modern Bible, uh, you will regularly find in a modern Bible little notes. So I've just highlighted one there. See the little yellow G that's next to the end of verse 35. So I'll just pick up, um, so for instance, this is, we had a reading from the NIV this morning. This is an NRSV, New Revised Standard Version. NRSV is regularly seen as a good academic Bible. And that little letter G refers to a little paragraph at the bottom of the page, right down at the bottom, which says, other ancient authorities put verses 34 to 35 after verse 40. That's all it says. So now I want to explain why that's important in a church where we encourage women uh, not just to read the Bible, but to go forward for ordination. We, you know, we've just said goodbye to Kim, who's being licensed on Tuesday evening. Jill and I are going to her licensing on Tuesday evening this week as the new team vicar down in the South Hams. So when it says other ancient authorities put verses 34 to 35 after verse 40, so you can see that I've used italics to highlight the bit that's in question. So up to the end of verse 33, and then we have the block that's got the comment, and then it goes to verse 36. The unique thing about these two verses is they are the only verses in the entire canon of the Bible that move. There isn't another footnote like that anywhere in the Bible. No one has found an early version. So when it says ancient manuscripts, it's talking about third or fourth century, maybe second century manuscripts. No one has come across a manuscript where a verse moves apart from this one. So how does that work? Well, what it means is there, were two, there are two versions out there. They were probably in Greek, because when they talk of ancient manuscripts, almost all the ancient manuscripts are in Greek. And so to highlight it, see, so what we have in our possession in the church global and in the museum somewhere is we have a manuscript that has it as it is on the screen, 
with that highlighted yellow bit there, and we have a manuscript where it's there. Now that's odd, do you not think? I think that's weird. What? When you think how carefully people copied manuscripts, because they're all hand copied, to take a paragraph and move it is just weird, don't you think? Quite odd. Why is that happening? Well, it's probably because before those two, there was this one. Now this one you might notice I have not highlighted anything. Because I suspect, this is the only way really can explain why a verse moves. I suspect the original version that was distributed didn't have verses 34 to 35 in it. But it was this one. Now why do I say that? Well that's because at some point someone has read it without verses 34 to 35 and has written something in the margin. The problem is wherever they wrote that in the margin of an original early copy has left a copyist with a problem. Some copyists have gone, ooh, maybe I should put that in. Where should I put it? So one of them has put it where it is on the screen and another one has put it totally independently somewhere else, having seen that original, has put it at the end. Which there are almost every scholar you read on this letter will say they believe verses 34, 35 are what are called a marginal gloss, uh, an, an, an edit that someone has put. So in other words, verses 34, 35, if you take them out, now read it. Does, I'm just going to take you back there. First of all, the English isn't good. Have you noticed? I mean, translators try quite hard to make English good. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Women should remain silent in the churches. Now, it's interesting. If you don't put a full stop after the word people, it sort of makes a bit more sense. As in all the congregations of the Lord's people, women should, not, should remain silent in the churches. The problem is, the verse that got moved starts after the word people. So we do need a full stop after people. As in all, uh, For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Women should remain silent in the churches. They're not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for women to speak in the church. Or did the word of God originate with you? What's happened at that junction between 35 and 36? That's a very strange connected sentence, don't you think? And the thing is, if you take 34, 35 out, all of a sudden it makes far more sense. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. And Paul sometimes can get a bit sarky. Or did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it reached? It makes sense without it there, doesn't it? As a combined... And, and you can imagine someone in the second or third century who, uh, by which time, well, in general culture, women were not considered uh, in most situations at that early stage in Europe to be part of a teaching culture. You can just imagine someone reading maybe an original going and just writing a note to himself. Going, Women should remain silent in the churches. So that's the very likely reason why that passage is where it is. I'm not going to say 100% definite, Paul didn't write it, but I would, the phrase I use is, I wouldn't go to the wall over it. it it's, it, I don't do that with any bit of scripture uh, to say that happens. When you read my booklet, what you will find is I do some, make some comments about what are called Paul's pastoral letters, the ones to Timothy and Titus which again are debatable. I've mentioned it in a, one of the earlier talks, in that they don't fit into Paul's timeline, the language is odd, the grammar is different, and they just don't feel like Paul. And to make them fit into his timeline, we have to do some real gymnastics with where Paul went when. Um, and it's interesting that here in Corinthians is, is the instruction about women not worshiping, and the other areas where women get difficult passages are in 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. What are disputable letters. Again, I'm not going to say they shouldn't be there, but I wouldn't go to the wall over what's there when we know that Paul talks about 
uh, friends of his who were women. He, he refers to Phoebe at the end of the letter to the Romans as a deacon in one of the churches. He, he, he patently includes women in what he's doing. So for those of us who've struggled with Paul and his misogynist uh, heritage, uh, I'd just encourage you to have a closer look. And if you want to get a bit more detail on that, have a look at what I've written in my booklet. So I'm coming back now. That was a digression, but it was such a blatantly obvious one with Gloria reading this morning that I couldn't not mention it. His churches, as he writes them, just seem uncomplicated. In this reading we've had, uh, when you come together, uh, and I put a little Greek word there, it's not because I'm in love with Greek now, but I'm going to refer to that word sin in the middle, S-Y-N, which is the beginning of the Greek word for come together. When you, when you come together, each of you has, and this was what was in our reading, a hymn a word, or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Two or three prophets should speak. The others should weigh carefully what is said. Everything must be done so the church may be build, built up and everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Isn't that interesting? Each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction. It's not the way we do church today, is it? Someone chooses the hymns. One person stands at the front and gives you a word of instruction. Uh, we have a moment in our church where we can have moments of where people think they may have a revelation. Uh, we don't often have, in fact, since I've been here, I, I can only think of one or two occasions where someone has had what we would biblically call a tongue, where someone says something in a language that's not recognizable. Um, and we've waited to see if there's an interpretation within the congregation. Because Paul suggests that you should only have those if you can interpret them. Two or three prophets should speak. Well, we allow people in our services to share insights, but the word being a prophet is very similar to being a preacher. It's not a, it's not a totally dissociated word. Um, so quite whether Paul means in the, in the style of the Old Testament prophets have direct revelation from God or someone who's speaking out of Scripture, not entirely sure. And then the others should weigh carefully what is said. Well, we don't do that in church, do we? Well, it's not quite right, is it? The last three or four weeks I've been encouraging us to do just that. And I said today I would explain why. This is why. Because you shouldn't believe everything I say. You should weigh it carefully. Because our faith is a communal faith, but it's also an individual one, and it's one that we need to build on, and we encourage uh, in all churches, folk to question things about faith. Or we should do. We need to weigh things up. And here in these early churches, it seems to be common practice. But note the last two qualifiers. Everything should be done so the church may be built up. So, no, and the Lord God said, you're all going to die next week because you're a bunch of sinners. We're not allowed to say that sort of thing in church. God won't say it to his prophets, and therefore... We shouldn't repeat it in church. We should be humble in the way we share insights that we think we've had from God and careful that we don't say the Lord God said because, well, he might not have done. It might have just popped into our own head without his help. So we often, when we share thoughts, we say, well, I think God might have said. And then we can weigh it up. And everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Now, that's where I think the later church uh, has come up with lots of regulation to make sure churches are definitely acting in a fitting and orderly way, um, which has meant we've lost so much of the other things. We've lost multiple speakers. We've lost discussion. They've gone from our church services in general. And the, I mentioned the word S-Y-N in that uh, Greek word. It's because a lot of those first century churches came from synagogues. So the Hebrew word for uh, a synagogue in the Old Testament is Bet Neset, now, a house of assembly. You might know that the Israeli parliament is the Knesset, word still in use. Uh, the Greek word synagogue comes from two words, sin and ago, uh, which is sin is the union or bringing together, or union or together, and ago is to bring together. So synagogue is a bringing together place. 
And the word that's used in Greek of a church is ecclesia, and that word also means a gathering or assembly of people. So the words themselves are about people coming together. But one of the things in my sabbatical that I found crucially helpful was a recognition that I had to find out some information on the history of those early synagogues because it was patently obvious that the early churches were coming out of those early synagogues in their practices. So there are two types of synagogue in the first century. They originate from the third century BC probably when they wouldn't have had buildings, they'd have been in Israel and they would have met at the, the town gates which was the place where you conducted business, it was the place where you held trials, it was the place where you had big discussions. Uh, and then in the second century BC, uh, historians think that's when there was a move towards community buildings generally in the east uh, of, of wanting to form structures where people could meet rather than hang around at the town gates. I don't know if it's because they were badly behaved at the town gates or I don't know what that move was, but there was generally a move in culture to build community buildings. And so synagogues in Israel become a building where they meet, but they're still in Israel a community building as well as a place of worship. It would have been a massive waste of resources to build a small gathering place um, where it was just for use on the Sabbath. So there were community buildings as well as, as uh, a place of worship. And um, as Judaism is spread through various uh, reasons in the rest of uh, Asia and Eastern Europe and moving into Europe, um, what's called the diaspora, the, the spread part of Judaism. That diaspora, well, they don't have the community basis of a village which needs a meeting place. So the ones that are in Turkey and Greece and so on, well, those are more like associations. It's like a club that forms. They don't have the village context for those synagogues. But the practices amongst them historically seem to be very similar. They need some running water generally because part of Jewish worship is about washing. You, it's a bit like our repentance moment in service. You wash before you begin anything to do with worship. They had, definitely had prayer. Uh, it wasn't always liturgical prayer. That doesn't necessarily come in uh, immediately or was used everywhere but they had prayer, they had some formal blessings that they would announce. But it was the reading of scripture that was the primary core part of any of those gatherings, but it wasn't reading one reading. Depending if it was the Sabbath, they might read two or three. If it was midweek, they might read one, or they might read two. There was no seeming rule. And there was no central organization of the synagogues. The temple wasn't like Canterbury Cathedral and things came out of the temple. The temple was a separate thing to the synagogues. There were these community centers where people met and they read scripture and discussed it. It was a place of teaching. And because it's community building, they probably had a meal together, which explains why when that transforms into what the church is in the places that we see in Paul's letters, as in Corinth, they're having a meal at the same time as they're having the worship. Now, Paul speaks into some of the issues they've got with their meal, but there's a meal. When people come together, they eat together, would have been very much part of that culture. So these early churches are doing that, and as I say, the, the general typical first century gathering would have been some form of gathering together. Um, there would have been prayer, uh, and I've put there in italics what we do. So we acknowledgement of the Holy Spirit for repentance, that we, we prophecy looking for the Holy Spirit for prophecy and insight or instruction and intercession that we we spend time waiting and praying so that we can continue in our worship we have scripture readings now here's the fascinating thing that I discovered in reading about this history of the early synagogues you notice on there I put scripture readings by a few well it doesn't seem uncommon for almost anyone to read the scriptures. The interpretation of them equally doesn't seem uncommon to invite people to give a thought on it. 
I'd always thought of them as being a very closed, isolated little community, but they weren't. I mean, in a village context, it was the village's synagogue, I guess. In the diaspora, maybe less so, but in the Jewish context, the readings could be said by several, and, and then they have this discussion moment and possibly a meal. And there's some illustration of these in Scripture. So, uh, in Luke 4, talking of Jesus, he went to Nazareth, Nazareth where he had been brought up. So, Jesus isn't part of the Nazareth community at the moment. He's arrived in Nazareth. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. So, Jesus was still going to the synagogue. He stood up to read. Now, what we don't know is whether or not the synagogue leaders saw Jesus come in and went, hey, look, it's Joseph's boy. Or did they go, hey, look, it's Jesus, the guy who we're hearing all these things about. We don't know why he was invited to read the scripture that day. Or did he just walk up to the front and pick it up and start reading it? So, but there's a hint here that actually you didn't have to be part of the synagogue community to read the text. Or what about asking for responses from people that those, you know, what we might today call the preaching slot? Well, in Acts, uh, in Antioch, after the reading from the Law and the Prophets, so that's they had the, uh, the first five books of the Bible and then the, that's the Law and the rest of the, what we call the Old Testament, the Prophets. So they had two readings on that day. After the reading from the Law and the Prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, that's the apostles who happened to be nearby, saying, brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Now, what we don't know from this text is, were they just hanging around outside? Or did they send to the hotel? I, I don't know how they communicated. Um, it doesn't look like they were in the room at the time. But isn't it interesting that actually the synagogue in Antioch wanted to hear someone else's opinion? It wasn't closed down. It wasn't, they didn't have a rule that said only, only certain licensed members of our congregation can read the Bible and only certain licensed people can say things about it. It was encouraged in that format. Discussion. Well, we see it in the Corinthians passage that we just had. Two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. The others, i.e. everyone else who's present. Now, I don't know what we do in our modern day churches as general practice, uh, I suspect if we were reading that and thinking about what we do, we're, we're thinking, so please do go home and think about it. But whatever you do, don't do it here, because it'll be chaos. Two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And on food, well, uh, the Corinthian church is the perfect example of how not to do it but they were doing it anyway. And it, and it undoubtedly comes out of a bit of a Jewish context or a, or a cultural context of just eating together. And Paul, this is, this is how we know they're doing it because they're not doing it well. So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. And we know this isn't just bread and wine. For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. And as a result, one person remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? So the Corinthian church got out of kilter on an awful lot of issues, and this was one of them. They, they were having a meal, but it was, it was only the ones known to them who they were sharing it with. So Paul's not really criticizing a meal, he's criticizing the way they're doing the meal. So this is all, for me, very interesting, uh, and I love the history of it all. But it does raise a big question for me, and maybe it raises the same question for you. Why do we do this? However we do it, if we do it in a complicated way or an uncomplicated way, why do we come together as a church? Have you ever thought about that? Why do we do it? Well, I want to start by thinking, well, what was, what's the, if, if, if there is a purpose towards us coming together, what was Jesus' purpose in coming? You might think that's a very obvious question. But Jesus did actually answer the question. What was Jesus' purpose? He said this in Luke 4, because they were trying to stop him from going somewhere. And he said, now I've got to go. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. 
proclamation of the kingdom of God was Jesus' primary purpose. At the beginning of his ministry, when he's asked to stay somewhere, and he says, I've got to go. Because I've got to tell people about the kingdom of God. Now, we may think of Jesus' coming to resolve sin and dying on the cross and enabling us to go to heaven. Well, he, yeah, that's also part of it. But that's not what Jesus said here. He said, I've got to proclaim the kingdom of God. There's something about the kingdom of God which is in itself an entire teaching series uh, that I'm not going to give. But the kingdom of God becomes important. So when we ask the question of ourselves, what's the purpose of us coming together, of assembling or gathering? I'm going to take you back to a verse we used last week and the week before from Ephesians. God's people are joined together and rise to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We know the Holy Spirit lives in us individually. We know we can ask the Holy Spirit's presence at any time. But there's something special about coming together to enable the Holy Spirit to dwell in a people as opposed to a person. God's people are joined together and rise to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too, are being built together. The Holy Spirit, as we discovered, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit in that dismissal at the end of Paul's letter. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit creates fellowship. And so, I just feel church shouldn't be as complicated as it is. After Paul wrote his letters, we then have the Gospels being written, we have uh, Peter's letters being written, James's letters being written, uh, letter of the Hebrews being written, Revelation gets written, we get the, the canon of the New Testament created. And by the end of the second century, that canon is formed, and the early churches then start arguing about, well, what did it mean for this? And they start forming councils of bishops to try to figure out what it all means. And that probably culminated most when the Emperor Constantine got so annoyed at the churches arguing with each other, he forced them all into a room and said, you've got to come up with a statement, uh, which is where we get the Nicene Creed from. But in trying to formalize, I, I, I do have a strong sense we might have lost something of that topic that I spoke about in week three of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Paul's primary purpose was to ensure that people knew who Jesus was and that they welcomed and accepted the action of the Holy Spirit. Because those two things change people. It's why he's so frustrated with the Corinthian church because they patently have not understood what the Holy Spirit's actions are. They think it's about being fantastic and speaking in tongues and all sorts of things. And they haven't changed their behavior a jot. And Paul is so frustrated about that, and he's so frustrated about it when he sees it in the other churches that he has to remind them of what bad behavior is. But we shouldn't need to be reminded of bad behavior if we have the Holy Spirit within us. We shouldn't need to know how to relate to our community if we have the Holy Spirit within us. It should be uncomplicated. So this idea of gathering of congregation that we read about in Ephesians 2, where God's people are joined together and rise to become a holy temple in the Lord, my suggestion is that that's wherever God is allowed to reign. And that's where his kingdom is. Because we know we're in a time where Jesus has announced God's kingdom, but you, you might remember from the Gospels, he, he varied. He said sometimes it's near, sometimes it's far, sometimes it's here. We're in an in-between time until the second coming when the whole world gets recreated. And in the in-between times, God's kingdom is sometimes near and it's sometimes far. And the easiest way to describe that is if you go back to the first century and you talk about a kingdom, you knew when you were in it and when you were out of it. You knew when you stepped over the border because there were new rules. And you also knew that if you broke those rules, you started to find out who the king was because you probably got imprisoned or killed. Now, fortunately, God neither imprisons us nor kills us, but we can know the reign of God when we accept the reign of God. And wherever God reigns, his kingdom is. His kingdom is. 
And so for a church to find Jesus and the Holy Spirit to dwell in unity is a place where the Holy Spirit can dwell, which means it's somewhere that God can dwell, which means his kingdom can be present. So wherever God is allowed to reign, that's where his kingdom is. And I think that's a purpose of a church. What we do individually outside the church, we're led by God individually through the gifts and talents that he gives us. We bring those together communally when we gather as a church, which is why in Paul's day, they encouraged several people to speak, they encouraged several people to read, they encouraged everyone to discuss. Because it was a place where you grew and you connected. I want to finish by just thinking about this matter of rules. In Romans, Paul wrote this about rules in chapter 14. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul again dealing with a question from Rome about eating and drinking that's obviously floating around all the churches. He's having to address it in more than one place. And he's saying the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. It's about righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. My suggestion is you can put any rule you want into those little yellow brackets. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of whether you wear robes or not. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of whether you meet at church at 10.30 in the morning or 9 in the morning or 11 in the morning. They're just... They're not what God's intention was. It doesn't take much of an imagination. I'm not going to reel them out because I'm on video and I might get into trouble if I start reading out lots of regulations that apply in churches. But whatever church you've been in, there have been some. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God. It allows God to reign for his kingdom to be present. In my sabbatical, I read lots of different books. Uh, one in particular was by a guy called Douglas Moo, who wrote a very, very readable but very large commentary on Romans. And regarding passages like this, he says this, we are warned that the Mosaic law, and hence all law, is unable to deliver us from the power of sin. That's what Paul writes about, about the law, that it, it's, it's not gonna help the Jewish law. All law is unable to deliver us from the power of sin. The multiplication of rules and commands, so much a tendency in some Christian circles, will be more likely to drive us deeper into frustration than improve the quality of our walk with Christ. I thought he summed that up brilliantly. That the more rules we put on to churches, the harder it is to walk with Jesus. Because we're thinking about the rules. And the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. It's about fellowship with God and the Holy Spirit. And Paul formally tells us that the law can't help in the Jewish context. The law is not helpful at all. What you need is Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Coming into land... Pondering some of this, I wrote in the little booklet that you can pick up afterwards, or that we'll, I'll try and get it distributed by email because I can't put it on the website. Um, I wrote this. Christ-centeredness and the welcoming of the Holy Spirit's lead feel through Paul's eyes as if they are a local church's primary role within God's mission to restore and recreate his world. For the church is, through Paul's eyes, Christ-centeredness and the welcoming of the Holy Spirit is crucial. Everything else to Paul just seems secondary. And by its absence from his writing, they don't seem to have been that important for our first century predecessors. I wonder what a first century church leader would think if they came to one of our churches today. You, You do that. Why do you do that? Oh, you don't do that. Why don't you do that? 
It's not that what we have as church today is wrong, it's just it's evolved. But the thing with evolution is you've got to make sure you keep some of the core DNA. And Douglas Moo's comments on regulation means sometimes we forget that core DNA of walking with Jesus, of welcoming the Holy Spirit. So I don't know what that means for us as a church. I, I, I'd like to think that we, when we are able to come back together properly, that we'll have the opportunity for more than one person to speak. That we'll share the opportunity for people to read texts to us from the Bible. That we'll have the opportunity for proper discussion. That we'll have the openness for prophecy and words of knowledge. Because we need to be built together to do that so that God can reign so that Jesus' purpose for coming to bring the good news of the kingdom of God can be fulfilled at least in this place so we can be a light to the community that surrounds us for wherever God is allowed to reign that's where his kingdom is is a firm belief of mine and we probably know that individually in our own lives when we're right with God things feel right and when we've sinned or done something deliberately against what we know might be his intention, we know what that feels like too. But when we let God have reign, his kingdom can be present. Until the time his kingdom will always be present. We're going to be led in our prayers in a second. But let's allow a moment where we can just say to God that we'd love him to reign in our lives. That we'd love him to reign in the life of this church. That we'd love him to reign in our lives, not just when we're here, but each and every moment of the day. Holy Spirit, we do welcome you. I personally thank you for the inspiration you gave me over those three months of reading and reflecting on Paul's letters. And while it, for me personally it was a, a wonderful time, it also has to have a purpose. And I don't know if this is the purpose, Lord, but if it is, I pray that by your Spirit you will enable us to be the people you need us to be. Lord, give wisdom to each of us Enable us to have discussion. Enable us to know your mind. Most of all, enable each of us to accept you into our lives as our king, where we can accept your reign, have a peace-filled life. Amen.